Welcome to the internet. Live from the Marriott Library at the University of Utah, this is the Red Line Podcast. I'm your host, Connor Dunstan, and these are my co-hosts... Alex Filda and... Kyle Holland. Today we're saying aloha, aloha. To, <laughs> to America's newest metro system, Honolulu Area Rapid Transit. How did this project come to be, and what will it do for America's favorite island? So, to understand how HART, or Honolulu Area Rapid Transit, has come to be, we need to understand a little about the beautiful city of Honolulu. Which is among America's densest cities, and its geography makes it uniquely suited to a system like HART. Yeah, that's right. So, Honolulu has around one million people in its metropolitan area. It should be noted that the metropolitan area of Honolulu is literally just the entire island of Oahu. Uh, <laughs> well, that, that simplifies things. I yeah, like that. It does yeah. make it simple, a sort of a natural boundary there. So when Hart is operational, it will be the smallest city in the United States to have a metro system Good by a you. large margin. Good nice. Like, the next one is maybe like Cleveland, oh. I, if, if you count the red line as a metro, which, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so... Yeah, it's kind of a big deal for a city this small to be getting, you know, like a fully grade separated, fully automated, all the deals, third rail, mind you. Interesting. Uh, metro system, yeah. Well, well that's cool. lucky then. Yeah, very <laughs> lucky. Because I guess all the other um, smaller, low million cities have been doing light rail of some description. Not even, like... Or just nothing. It's just nothing, mostly. Like, the, some of the smallest cities with light rail are like, you know... 2 million, 1.5 million, Mm -hmm. like not big cities. So this is impressive. Yeah. Uh, I I hope it sets a solid precedent. (laughs) Yeah. Boise, Boise Rapid Transit, except it's fully automated light metro. Beyonce. Bart. Boise Boise Area 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 Rapid Rapid Transit. (laughs) (laughs) Boise Metropolitan. Anyway. Uh, So the reason that this is possible is because Honolulu and its suburbs are situated in sort of a unique arrangement. So on Oahu, there is exactly one freeway, and that is called H1, or Honolulu 1, or excuse me, Hawaii 1. Good naming. Good naming. Yeah, (laughs) makes sense, right? And they are trapped between the mountains and the sea, and they're all along this single corridor. Hmm. Mm -hmm. I wonder if that would make this area conducive to running a high-capacity transit line right down the middle of it. Hmm. Wow. And here we are. Yeah, so when Hart is finished, like, 90% of the population of Oahu is going to be within, like, a relatively short distance of it. That is really impressive for a single line. Yeah, because the project has three phases. The first two phases takes it downtown and to the airport. And then the third phase sort of does this weird branch in the middle to cut time off the trip because the airport sort of goes out of its way a little bit. Mm Mm-hmm. That will make it so effectively everyone is served by it. <laughs> so <laughs> cool. So it's perfect location then. Yeah. So it's 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 quite an impressive project, even if it has had some major major issues, which we will get into later. And like, I mean, major issues. <laughs> yeah. Well, judging by the expected completion of the downtown section by 2031. Yeah. Can already... It was supposed uh, to open this year. Well, so there that's, must be some something. serious issues then. There are really serious issues, guys. Like, big <laughs> issues. So let's to sort of set ourselves up for this whole deal. Let's go over a short history of public transportation in Honolulu. Uh, So public transportation was first introduced to Honolulu in 1898 with the founding of the Honolulu Rapid Transit Company. Coincidentally, or probably not coincidentally, um, that was the same year that a bunch of white dudes uh, did a coup on the Queen of Hawaii at the time and made it part of the United States. Hmm. So, uh... That that might have something to do with it. That might have something to do with it. Yeah. So, HRT, as it was called, operated streetcars from 1901 to 1941. 
kind of a weird year to stop running them, uh, yeah. given the, what about the is rest anyone of the aware of a uh, major historical event that happened on Oahu in 1941? You mm. know, maybe a day that will live in infamy. Uh, did, did they, like, sell a lot of fruit or something? <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what happened. Okay. No, uh, Pearl Harbor happened, and for some reason the same year, or maybe earlier in the year, uh, they had just stopped running the streetcars. So I thought that was a weird little bit of historical synchronicity. Yeah, that, that's weird, right. because that would have been anything expected them to run through the war. Yeah. So everyone just walked around? I, no, there were buses and stuff. They, they had trolley buses from 1937 to 1957 there as well, so... Mm. Nice yeah. twenty year span. Yeah, nice twenty year span. And so I take it that the island had the same fate as the rest of America. Yeah, basically, they built a giant freeway, also known as H one, down the middle of it, and then just only ran motor buses. So HRT also had some competing motor bus companies in the Honolulu suburbs and around the rest of the island. <laughs> Don't you just love a good like classic American capitalist public transportation competition? They're always so amusing, it especially is. thinking about how small that island is. Right. The like, fact that they could have more than one. Like There are five, six companies here in Honolulu, <laughs> or the area of Honolulu, and just, like, you know, all fighting each other for riders and stuff. Like, very based. But unfortunately, as with all privately owned American public transportation companies, the car killed HRT, and it went bust in the 1960s and 70s after prolonged labor strikes during those years. Uh, several of these strikes left passengers without bus service for more than 60 days, Oof. including one in 1967, which lasted for 67 days. Oof. Wow. So, you know, I'm pro-labor, as is well known. Labor unions are good, actually, and are the reason that we all don't, like, suffer in coal pits all the time with, like, no time off. But... It's possible to resolve a strike. It is possible to resolve strikes. It's yeah. kind of the point of a strike is that it gets resolved eventually. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, that's the idea. It's like, wow, if you're having this many strikes, maybe you're doing something wrong. Maybe. J yeah. Just a thought. I feel bad for all the people then. So, 67 days. That must have sucked. Like, Honolulu, not a huge city, but it is large enough that it's probably not a huge amount of fun to walk around it. Yeah. Uh, so, understandably, the city of Honolulu began to look into acquiring HRT under the administration of Mayor Fassi, and then they did that. Ooh. And they bought all of the bus lines in Honolulu for $2 million. <laughs> <laughs> Classic boomer money move right there. So, like I said, this was done under the administration of Mayor Fassi. And because there are no school buses in Honolulu schools, many students ride the bus to school every day. And so students quickly nicknamed the bus in Honolulu Uncle Fassie's Limousine Service, which I think is funny. <laughs> it's, that's, still, that's still a nickname it has among students to this day, I believe, is Uncle Fassie's Limousine Service or just Uncle Fassie's. So, well, why weren't there school buses to begin with? That's a good question, and it might be because there was always a relatively robust public transportation network, so there wasn't any need for them. Like, mm. there, I don't believe there are school buses in New York or a lot of Boston either. I've seen Spider-Man. He, he takes, takes a subway bus. to school. Uh -huh. yeah, he takes a school uh -huh. bus. He takes a subway to school, man. There's a subway station right outside his school. We're talking about different Spider-Man movies, then. Oh, maybe. I'm talking about the modern ones. I'm talking about the old ones. Oh, those are lame, <laughs> because you probably take the subway or the MTA to school. Yeah. If, yeah. you, if you go to school in New York. Like, why would you, like, leave, like, an hour and a half before school starts to take the, the yellow school bus that's going to, And you like, could leave an hour and a half before school starts to take the subway? Or leave, like, half an hour before school starts More to take likely, the subway. More likely. Subway, yeah. The subway isn't that slow. <laughs> mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's not fast, but it's not slow either. That, that makes sense. If you've got something good, you don't need to replace it. Yeah, yeah. no. Until you do, probably. But. Yeah, which is one of the reasons that Salt Lake City is actually cutting back on school bus usage and giving all of its students uh, free UTA passes. Oh, yeah, I is heard it, about isn't that. Isn't that also because there's no bus drivers or anything? Yeah, I believe, yeah. That, <laughs> I believe that they're just relying on UTA because they can't hire bus drivers because UTA doesn't pay bus drivers particularly well, but bus companies just don't pay them, like um, pittance wages. Well, yeah. I don't know. If you get more young people riding the bus, they're going to be more likely to ride the bus in the future. Yeah, very mm -hmm. much a culture of transit That's, ridership. Yeah, so, 
Uh, yeah, the city established mass transit lines to take over bus operations and purchased all of the suburban operators, as we said a few minutes ago. MTL was then disbanded 22 years later in 1992 and rebranded very creatively as The Bus. <laughs> like, it is just spelled capital T-H-E, capital B-U-S. And that is the name of the current mass transit operator for Honolulu. I really hope someone got paid to come up with that. Someone got paid a crap ton of money <laughs> to make come up with that. <laughs> like, you just know that some consultant was just rolling in cash after they came up with that idea. <laughs> but more seriously, transit in Honolulu has been very, very successful, especially for a city of its size. Ridership uh, reached 70 million a year in the 20 teens, and it has over 70 rides per capita per year. Dang. Making, yeah, making it the sixth highest per capita ridership in the country. Uh, this explains well. the new rapid transit project. So, yeah, Honolulu is up there with Boston, with Philly, with Chicago, with New York. Somehow, random, very suburban city in in the Pacific Ocean is competing with America's great transit metropolises. Cool. Oh. So, quite impressive, yeah. And notably why they are building a rapid transit line. Because, like, they're getting 100,000 riders a day. On buses. On buses. On buses. Post-pandemic. So, basically, when they get the new rapid transit system in place... They are going to double their ridership, and they are going to be one of the most transity cities in America. Mode share go burr. Mode share will very much go burr, yes. Wow. So, very exciting things. So, that's that's basic, you know, bus-based, normal, everybody has it, public transportation in Honolulu. Except with high ridership. Except with high ridership, <laughs> because it's a pretty dense city, and they run decent service. The crazy um, the development that's conducive to transit and walking plus good transit means people use transit. What an interesting concept. Well, and no way to expand freeways. And no way to expand freeways, yeah. This is true. Because I cannot stress this enough. Like, they literally have no space. They have one freeway. There's no space for more lanes. There's no space for another freeway. They're I imagine stuck. there's but, no parking either. Yeah, there's not, there's not yeah. much space for parking. But either. you know what there is space for? An elevated transit system. This is correct. So, how Hart got its start? Honolulu area leaders have been trying to construct a high-capacity transit line since the 60s, which was the era of the Great Society metros. So, effectively, Hart is, you know, like a Washington metro, but just sort of transplanted into 2020. Because it was originally meant to be an analogous system. Back in the day, and they're only now getting around to having it exist. Yeah, so as we mentioned, because the city is limited to one highway, it has among the worst, I think it's actually rated the worst right now, but it's always had the worst traffic congestion in the country because, you know, one highway. So leaders have been forced since a very early date, back when people were still like, oh, we can just build our way out of, you know, freeway congestion. No, leaders back then in Honolulu were like, crap, we can't do that. We've already discovered this and we're out of space. So we got to build high capacity transit of some kind. I'm glad that they realized this back then. Like Salt Lake area still hasn't realized this. <laughs> no. Yeah, it makes sense though. I don't know how you couldn't realize that. Yeah. I'm glad they didn't demolish a ton of homes and just kept building lanes. Uh, oh. They did. <laughs> <laughs> so they did that. But, you know, uh, so as they're building, as they're trying to get this thing built during the Great Society era, like Johnson and Nixon and, you know, Carter are just like, yay, money for metros, have some. Yay. Build build the Miami Metro Rail and the BART and the Atlanta Metro and the Washington Metro. Go, go out, my children, and build these things. So they're like, yes, Honolulu, we're going to build these things, too. It's going to be great. And behold, the government invested in infrastructure, and it was good. And behold, the Reagan administration happened. Did, <laughs> did Reagan do anything good? No. Okay. Uh, Wasn't he, like, the national debt guy? He was, like, the pretend he's going to fix the national debt, but then increase the deficit by cutting taxes guy. He was a get rid of every nationalized thing ever. 
Yeah. And just kind of ruin the country and get rid of unions. Yeah, we're still we're still trying to fix the Reagan damage. So <laughs> I don't know. A lot of damage for one president. Yeah. yeah. I'm impressed. Yeah. 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 And his solution to people starving was to give them cheese. Also, that should be noted. So <laughs> well, because okay, maybe he was right about something. Because the U.S. government. Okay, this is a side story, but we're gonna keep this in here because it's hilarious. So the U.S. government during the '80s was very happy to give businesses welfare because, you know, that's the Republican Party, but not to give people welfare, right? That's not very nice. Yeah. So the dairy farmers were having trouble selling all their dairy because they hadn't gone through the Got Milk campaign yet. So dairy was at its (laughs) lowest ebb ever in terms of marketing it and like sales and stuff. So the Reagan administration, to subsidize the continued existence of the dairy industry, and so bought just, just, like, a metric crapload of cheese. And then gave it to poor people. Well, right. And then a couple years later, they cut, like, food stamp benefits and stuff, and instead just gave poor people cheese. What? So, <laughs> don't we still have tons of cheese in America? Like I believe America we have a strategic of, cheese reserve. Is it in yes. Wisconsin? I believe so. Okay, that makes sense. Well, I believe we have a strategic <laughs> cheese reserve, yes. Well, I'm not too mad about that. No. I do like my cheese. But, yeah, anyway, Reagan was like, nope, nobody gets, you know, metros. You got to build light rail instead. And so everybody built light rail instead. But Honolulu was like, well, That's that really isn't going to work for us. We don't have the kind of right of way that you would need for that. But so they just, on an island, they believe, believe it or not, are not a yieldy railroad town. Correct. So uh, instead of, you know, continuing to work for that, they just didn't. They just canceled the entire project. All the studies were just trashed. So that's a big money project. Yeah, if you can't get the money, like, yeah. you can't really argue with someone who doesn't want to pay for it. Yeah, and that trashing lasted for approximately four years until Mayor Fassi was elected again in 1984 and restarted the project. Nice. Wait, Fassi is back? Yeah, the same guy who, who the fat, Uncle fat. Fassie's limousines. Nice. He's back. It sounds like Fassie's done a lot for the mm-hmm. island of he's, Honolulu. He's kind of a big deal. Soon, though, he was out of office again due to running for governor of Hawaii, which I believe he won, and right. the project was canceled again. <sighs> <laughs> so the new mayor, of course, proposed an interim BRT system. Oh, my God. But his effort was ultimately unsuccessful, and that project was canceled and he left office without any high-capacity transit being implemented in the area. They do realize it's possible to not cancel the rail project. And <laughs> when just a let new it, mayor comes into office. Yeah, and just let it <laughs> sit there uh, waiting for funding, which they're, you know, actively trying to acquire instead of canceling it every every election cycle. Yeah, <laughs> see the Max Green Line extension. Well, was this, like, a really big hot-button issue for voters? It has been for years. Yeah. And, like, yeah. It, it's always, like, a, a thing because people want it because traffic is so bad. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But, like, it's hard to get a project like this done in America. Yeah. And then, I believe, eight years after that guy was out of office and a new mayor was into office, another new mayor came into office. And in 2004, yet another attempt was made at building a rapid transit system, bringing us the heart project that we know today. So, 2004 <laughs> was the impetus for the project design we have now. That is correct. Or that we partially have now. Yes, because things obviously change over, you know, a period of time, <laughs> which it has been since 2004. Yes, it has. Jeez. So, fun fact, Hart is only one year younger than I am. You'd think it would not take them my entire life to build this, but I digress. They're not done yet. Yeah. (laughs) They'll probably be dead from the climate wars by the time they finish. Yeah, I'll be dead from the climate wars by then. So, Hart spent most of the aughts in a never-ending purgatory of environmental impact statements and other studies. So, that's about five years that they spent doing EISs and (sighs) studies and locally preferred alternatives and et cetera, et cetera. And, oh, lawsuits from NIMBYs and et cetera. The EISs always amuse me because it always depends on who's doing them, right? Like, if UDOT, our state highway (laughs) department, wants to build such and such freeway something or other for, like, half a billion dollars or whatever... They will do the EIS, they will publish it, they will publish alternatives, they will choose the one of their alternatives they were going to build anyways, and then they will proceed to build it without asking anybody. Yeah. That, Seriously. That's what they're doing with the gondola right now. Uh, yeah. They asked people. They did And ask they didn't people. listen. You know how long the EIS is for the gondola? Oh, I know. It's like 20,000 pages. Yeah. <sighs> like, like UDOT still does all the EIS mess and paperwork and outreach and alternatives and everything, but at the end of the day, they're just going to build whatever they want to. Oi, yeah. we might have to do a gondolas episode so that we have an episode or an excuse to talk about the gondola. Yeah. We should have Which I know you guys are rabidly opposed to, but yeah. I am sort of ambivalent on it. I'm very 
I might write my essay on that. Oh, okay. For my environmental well, writing. The class good somewhere. news is, in the near term, they're going to go ahead and yeah, road tolling. Do tolling and, and also improve. improve bus service. Yeah. What? Well, <laughs> well, yeah. I'm assuming that means. You see, people act like this is going to deter people from going up the canyons, and I know that like in urban planning brain it will and it actually will but like people here are so freaking car brain that is see not gonna connor what i'm thinking is they're going to look at traffic volumes and they are going to set the tolls and vehicle count restrictions well enough that they've the bus set is it at 25 bucks for the sort of for the sort of clientele i'm not sure that's enough see i i don't think well we can always talk about this later but. yeah this is very off topic. Yeah. So anyway, once they got out of environmental purgatory, you'll never guess what other uh, major historical event happened. Which one? The Great Recession. Oh, yeah, that one. <laughs> that did happen. That did happen. Mm -hmm. uh, so the project was supposed to start construction in 2009, but this was pushed back due to concerns over the Great Recession because they had a Republican governor at the time. <sighs> Isn't building things, like, a good way to bring your economy out of a recession? Sure, but only if it's things the Republicans like. For example, highways. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't the point of the whole New Deal from the FDR days to build a bunch of things to bring the economy out of the depression? Well, yeah, they yeah. didn't build freeways under the New Deal. Well, but they built things. They yeah. built a lot of dams and bridges FDR and FDR was a Democrat. Yeah, yeah. Uh, FDR <laughs> saved the country, but then in wouldn't my it opinion. Make, uh, wouldn't it make sense? The greatest sense? president except for that one thing he did where he locked all the Japanese citizens in. Oh, yeah, that one. <laughs> you gonna, yeah. But, Connor, wouldn't it make sense to build this fancy new $5 billion complicated infrastructure project to help bring the local economy out of the recession? No. And the reason for that is because, like most American transit products or er, projects, it is funded by sales tax. And during a recession, there is a significant decrease in sales tax revenue. And the state government did not want to cover the shortfall of that because they were having revenue issues of their own. Finally, though, once Obama was in power, praise be, uh, <laughs> in 2012, the city and county of Honolulu signed a contract with the Federal Transit Administration to build the line for a total cost of $5.1 billion. So, or so they thought. Well, at the time, that would have been a pretty reasonable cost for elevated red metro in America. Like, and it's, it's a 20-mile 20, 20 20 system. system, so it would have been $250 million a mile. That's not bad. Which is entirely reasonable for elevated metro. And Although, Wouldn't a lot of stuff have to be imported as well onto the island? You see, that's another thing with higher costs in Hawaii, is that it was always going to cost more, because doing anything in Hawaii costs more, because you have to ship it over several thousand miles of ocean. So Whoa. that seems reasonable, then. It's entirely reasonable. Because was, unlike Salt Lake, they don't have, like, two giant concrete mining pits in the city. Yes. And, <laughs> Soon you know, to be three. A, good, <laughs> a good portion of Hawaii is, like, protected natural natural land because, you know... Understandable. So is that... freaking Hawaii. Is that another reason it was in EIS purgatory? Yes, actually. Um, oh. Lots of environmental regulation. We will get... That is in our why it costs so much section okay. at the very end. Because I would have figured that wouldn't be too much of an issue because it's being built in the urbanized corridor. Uh-huh. And not like in the in the nature part. There are other issues there. I suppose Let we'll us get continue to those. the story. <laughs> so, Hart is similar to Miami Metro Rail, also notable for being a massively delayed and over over budget project and a product of the 80s, um, <laughs> in that it will be almost exclusively elevated throughout its alignment. Where is it not elevated? It's it will be exclusively elevated throughout its alignment. Oh, you so, said almost exclusively. Sorry, I just, yeah, that was a typo on my part. I don't believe there are any non-elevated sections. This one's sections. funny because it's literally completely elevated, whether it should be or not. How would, how would they get ma maintenance? Would there be an elevated maintenance? For the vehicles? Yeah, like... Oh, there's a ground-level storage facility for vehicles, but there's, like, a ramp. Okay, so... So, okay. I, I got it, yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, it will run from the western suburb of... And native Hawaiians and transplant Hawaiians and anyone who speaks Hawaiian in any way, shape, or form, please, God, forgive me. It will run from the western suburb of Kualakai and around Pearl Harbor, serving various suburbs along the way. After rounding the northern tip of the harbor, it turns south to serve Honolulu's International Airport and then back to the east to head downtown where it will eventually terminate at the uh, Ala Moana Center in the heart of Honolulu's CBD. 
Well, um, yeah. that covers 90% of everybody. That covers most people, yeah. So I take it they're also going to try and have people not rent cars and just take the train everywhere when they visit? I from... reckon, yes, because yeah. a unique uh, sort of characteristic of this system is that there are rumors that the cars will have dedicated surfboard racks. That's yeah. cool. Yeah. That's very, that's very right. locally specific. Yes. I like it. I like that. So <laughs> it is very much going meant to serve both a local population and the large tourist population. Well, you see both of them surf, so. Yes. Um, it is a popular activity among both of them, so yeah. this is true. That's a good idea. Well, that is a very good idea. Uh, yes. So the rail operations and maintenance center will be located at the northern end of Pearl Harbor. And like we said, it sort of ramps down to meet the rail center and then goes back up all (laughs) elevated interesting choice in a lot of the area but i digress so uniquely it is america's first modern light metro system having a lot in common with skytrain or the rem in montreal it will run fully automated and uses smaller rolling stock than traditional american metro systems and is expected to run at very high frequencies every five minutes during peak times and roughly every 10 during off peak and what? because it's and because it's 100% grade separated, they can just run even more than that if they want. Yeah, if they want to buy more trains, they can run as much as they like. So every 10 minutes off peak. Yeah, it's going to run 20 hours a day, so I believe five ish to one ish. And there is best. and there's more capacity to do even more. Yes, there is. In terms of the rolling stock, this is like extremely modern. It's completely walk through. Nice. Okay. Very good. And then, you know, like we said earlier, this does have platform screen doors, which is a first for (laughs) the United States. I was going to say North America, but I believe Montreal might have some on some of their lines. But they're going to have it at every single platform. Every platform. Well, that is a lovely very, precedent. Very, very modern. That's probably nice for nice for everybody's safety. Well, and it's very good because since this is a third rail system, yeah, oh, it's also okay. it's third rail <laughs> yeah. and it's automated, both of which, um, yeah. So it will have an average speed of about thirty miles an hour and a top speed of fifty-five. Good. Very light metro. Yeah. yeah. So the journey along the full twenty-mile line will take forty minutes. Nice. That's, that's probably faster than that the cars, is, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> Very competitive, very speedy, yes. very good. Yes. Um, uh, and when it is complete, Hart will carry 120,000 people daily. That's your doubling in ridership right there. Yeah, making it one of the busiest lines in the western half of the United States. Sweet. I think off the top of my head in the western U.S., the only single transit line that's going to compete with that is maybe the Link once it's built out, Link Light Rail. I would believe that. All right. Because it, like it does it does eighty six thousand now, and they're planning some real major extensions to the s- okay. They're making line. it really, really long. Yeah, <laughs> that's cool. But Hart is getting all of this off of one twenty mile line. Yeah, because so. of their unique geography. So is it all elevated? So you don't get any traffic at all on the ground. The, it's a metro system. It's not going to interact with traffic in any way. It doesn't interact with anything on the ground in any way. It doesn't interact it's... with anything except itself and okay. birds. Well, <laughs> well, birds shouldn't be too much of an issue. Black. Yeah, well, <laughs> that's bird stuff. Yeah. yeah. So what's the what's the problems then? So, cost, cost overruns, of, delays, etc. is the section name. The, the cost snake. Yeah, the, the American cost snake has bitten this one and <laughs> bitten it hard. Or I should say the North American cost snake because can, Canada, Canada has a lot of these same issues. So, instead of the initial cost of $5.1 to $5.3 billion, Hart is now expected to cost $12.45 billion to complete. That, that is over like- double. Yeah, that seems like a lot more than... Yeah. Yeah. And additionally, the opening of the line, which is initially supposed to be... And this is the entire line. Like, you know, Koala Kalei suburb to downtown Honolulu was meant to open two years ago in 2020. Oof. Instead, the first section of the line to the airport and, like, downtown adjacent area will open late this year or maybe even next year. And the actual downtown section is not expected to open until 2031. So wh- why why is the downtown section pushed back so much? Many reasons. Number one is cost, because the costs of the rest of the thing are mostly like consistent-ish or not that inflated from the rest from their original estimate. Mm-hmm. But the downtown section is just like <laughs> <laughs> that was the sound of me blowing up a balloon. The cost balloon. 
The cost balloon. The so costs are literally ballooning. So they're using the money that they have now to build the, m- the normal. first section. Yeah, that section. Yeah. So why do we have these cost issues? Number one, it got bit by the American cost snake. So <laughs> these are, you know, contracting issues, the thing that Americans love to do, where first of all, we contract out every single aspect of a project to like 40 billion different contractors, and then they all have to learn to work together. And then also we have weird labor laws and weird safety laws and weird everything. There should just be a government department that just goes around city to city and builds metro systems. That would be a good idea, but we don't do that. And so we never retain any... Oh, that's another part of the American cost snake is that we never retain any institutional knowledge of how to build these things because because we build them A, super infrequently and B, always using different agencies that never collaborate with one another. That does seem like a problem. Yes. (laughs) Which means every single new project is starting over from scratch. Basically. So if we had all of the proper infrastructure and all the knowledge, we could actually do it cheap. Yeah, if we had institutional knowledge and we weren't so incompetent about how we do contracting and labor practices, we would probably be more on par with international averages. Like we're not we're never going to be Spain and building metro lines for like 60 million dollars a mile. No. But but at least we'd have like a manageable cost. Like 200 million dollars for a mile is a reasonable cost for a metro. And line. if we could do that and do it consistently and just go city to city, metro, 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 no problem. Yeah. That's the American and, dream. You know, we're actually going to have an episode in the next few episodes called The Transit Cost Crisis, which is going to be very long, very detailed, and probably not going to get any views, but it doesn't matter because it's important <laughs> anyway. Um, and that will go over the American cost snake, as I have taken to calling it, <laughs> in I, detail. I, I'm, I'm good can with we that name, name it? sticking around. Yeah, can we name the episode that? Yeah, no. Oh. That, that won't make any sense. Uh, also an issue is that um, officials at the Honolulu Authority for Rapid Transportation, which is the agency building it, uh, probably lied about how much it would cost in the first place. Did they not know you're supposed to pad your estimates? Yeah, so they probably knew it was going to cost more. Uh, and then just didn't say that because they wanted it to look good. Well, that's that's yep. a thing that a lot of agencies do, unfortunately. Oof. That seems like a... No, you're supposed to under-promise and over-deliver, not the other way around. Exactly. Under-promise, yeah. over-deliver. That is the fundamental paradigm of public administration. And also, like, engineering. You're, you are supposed to <laughs> promise the minimum and then do as much as you can to do better. Yep. That seems reasonable. Yeah. It's what, like... What UTA did with the Frontlines project. Like, that project came in two years ahead of schedule and $300 million under budget. Perfect. Everyone's happy. Because they hedged their bets. Yep. Or, you know. And they also did good contracting. What else can I think of that's a good project like that? The original Max Blue Line. Uh, you know, $23 million and a year ahead of schedule. So, everyone yeah, wins. Everyone wins when you do, when you're competent. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's funny. <laughs> So then we get into, and this was going to be a cost issue regardless of the incompetence of the Honolulu Authority for Rapid Transformation, human remains, archaeological interest, and environmental protection. Because they are building a new thing. So Honolulu and Oahu in particular are a very interesting geographical setup. So first of all, like a really significant portion of the island is protected by the federal government as wilderness. So... You know, whenever you're building anything there, you have extra steps because it's a really important part of our ecological heritage as a country. Mm -hmm. So that's just a whole layer that's always there. And then also, Honolulu um, and, you know, the Hawaiian Islands in general, I don't know if anyone here is familiar with archaeological studies like that. Probably not. So whenever you're building a project over land that is previously owned by native people, which the entirety of Hawaii is, you have to be very careful because human remains are a thing. And you cannot disrespect the human remains of native occupants of an area because that is against federal law. It's morally wrong. And, you know, it sort of violates a lot of the religious beliefs of native people. Yeah. So when sense. when you are building in an area that was exclusively owned by native people for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, like Honolulu, suddenly whenever you are, you know, 
building anything. If you drill a pylon in the ground, you have to spend a lot of time making sure that you're not drilling into someone's gravesite first. So every single one of these concrete pillars is an archaeological dig. Is an archaeological dig. So you need especially downtown because gotcha. that was Honolulu has been continuously inhabited since like Jesus. So you have to pay a lot of specialists to do actual smart work and you have no to pay things. archaeologists. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You have to pay archaeologists to research and make sure that you can put a pile on there. Yeah. I bet they're very happy. For every single one. Yeah, every single one, yeah. Which is really good that we're so doing this. don't let anyone uh, tell you that archaeology is like an impractical degree because there is always this sort of job. Yeah. But So how is this not an issue in like all of America then? This is a good because question. Because the density of the remains that makes sense. of sites. Because Take not only was Oahu continuously inhabited for a very long time, it was densely inhabited by sedentary people. Because it's an island. Okay. Right. Like, North Amer- like on the continent, a lot of native people here were a little more nomadic, so they moved around a lot more. Or they had specific sites, you know, in And the overall places. population density was a lot lower, too. Right. And the other thing is, a lot of the places that they had densely populated, we just don't live in anymore. Yeah. Like Manhattan Island, they just it was sold off because the Native people didn't really care about it very much. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh-huh. So, like, the same thing goes for places like Boston. Like, there just weren't, like, a ton, ton of Native people living there. They lived in other places nearby, but, but they didn't there. live in the specific place. And also, a lot of our legacy metro infrastructure was built before we cared about these things. <laughs> <laughs> so if, if you stumble upon human remains when doing any projects nowadays, you'd have to do that once you find them, rather than before. You're supposed to do it before you find them. I know, but if, you're, if it's unexpected. Yeah, 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 then you just have to basically urge, slam on the brakes. I take it it's very expected they would find human remains there. They knew they would. Yeah. And yeah. That's one of the reasons why, because it's very sensitive when dealing with human remains for mm-hmm. a lot of for a lot of native people. I don't know the specific beliefs of the Hawaiians, but I took an archaeology class last year and we had a whole unit on this. It's very sensitive dealing with the remains because, you know, in all religions basically even, like, Catholics believe, like, you're not supposed to disturb the remains of the dead yeah. because then they can't get into heaven or whatever. So you have to get, you know, like, permission from their descendants, and a lot of times that takes a long time to get, and if you can't get it, you still have to build the thing, so you have to go through the federal government and all this crap to make sure that you are treating, you know, human remains and especially indigenous human remains correctly. So bureaucracy, but it's actually... For a good reason? Yes. Yeah. Okay. A lot of bureaucracy for a good reason, but it does drive up costs. And so that was always going to be a cost here. Well, you got to do what you got to do. Yeah, and I'm glad they're do. taking it seriously and like, respectfully. That's not a bad cost thing. It's just a thing we're no, paying No, it is for. just a thing that you have to deal with when you build in areas like that. Yeah. Yeah. So, As opposed to, like, the lack of institutional knowledge and the bad contracting, which just cost money yeah, and that's don't get the, As opposed to the American cost thing, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well. So, and, like, you know, they have to deal with these, like, they build metro lines in Rome. Whew. So, think about that. Oh this this is an issue that exists everywhere. Mm-hmm. I, and I thought underground utilities were bad enough. Imagine just no. having, like, actual Rome like, underground. Like, Paris, they have the catacombs. They build metro lines all the time. London has How been inhabited since, like, bazillion years ago. They build mm-hmm. new metro lines. So, you know, other people know how to do this. I mean, I guess London just deep tunnels. Yeah. Like, very, very deep tunnels. Yeah, yeah. You've, you've seen some of the 3D renderings of, like, when they're putting in a new tube station. It's like, tube station, other tube station under below tube that, station, other tube, tube station, station farther below that. Yeah. And then there's, like, this giant concourse Beautiful of half-mile tunnels and Beautiful escalators. Beautiful cross-platform transfers, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like, this isn't a unique thing to Honolulu, but it is sort of the first time America's done it. So it is possible that it being the first time we've done it like this because we just didn't care about these things for a long time because we're assholes. Um, <laughs> well put. It is possible that it being the first time we did it also drove up costs of that sort of archaeological work. That makes sense. Yeah. Well, I say good for them and... Yeah, good on you. Yeah. Good on you, Honolulu. Um, and then we have usual NIMBY nonsense, like, of course. you know, they spent like a hundred million dollars or whatever fighting NIMBYs in courts, so there you go. <laughs> Great. Well, well, we love that the government can be sued <laughs> for building things. 
building things in the middle of a freeway, mind you. Like, I get a lawsuit if the government's trying to, like, eminent domain your property or something and you're really attached to it. But the government is building a thing on land the government owns by other more similar things that have even worse impacts on the surrounding environment. So, um, sort of the final issue that I would say there is with Heart is in the design itself, because like we said, basically exclusively elevated, right? Mm -hmm. The trouble is it runs over open fields through um, some significant portions of its section. So it's viaduct over farms. Which I mean is nice for the farmers, like they don't have to deal with the train. Sure, Uh, but also, you know what a great way to reduce costs is? Just put it on the ground. Put it on the ground. And, it on the and ground. Then use underpasses every so often. Use underpasses or overpasses every so often, and it will save you money. Like it's it's kind of ridiculous. Like let's let's have a yeah. What's the reason they let's have a to look, this? shall we? Is this, this is this is an actual picture of <laughs> Honolulu's rail running over like I don't know what the crop this is. It looks kind of like lettuce or something. Is this just like a long-term planning thing? Like are they expecting not necessarily. development there eventually? Not necessarily. Like this mm. isn't near a station or anything. But mm. like kind of just runs over an open field in a viaduct. I mean, I question that from a cost perspective, but it's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. So I do I love the coupling between the carriages. Yes. That you can walk through. Yeah, them. fully walk through trains are very nice. I wish we had those. We but. will be maybe getting them actually. Yay. <laughs> it's very easy to do with light rail. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so that is Honolulu area rapid transit, America's newest, most modern, and most cost overrun metro line. Cool. So For some good and bad reasons. For some good and some bad reasons, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's still definitely not New York levels of cost overrun. Like it's, <laughs> it's it's like five hundred million dollars a mile instead of like two billion or whatever the Second Avenue subway is, and like I mean, it certainly helps ten the billion that the Gateway project is going to oh be. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, it certainly helps that this is viaducted instead of tunneled, and a lot of it's just not in that. Oh, you can't tunnel in Hawaii. Understandable. Oh, it's full of water, sea level. <laughs> yeah, no, it's just the geography of Hawaii in general, like the. The geology, I should say, is not conducive to tunneling. Well, it's all really hard volcanic rock that's soft as well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's hard in the wrong places and soft in the right one or in the wrong ones. So it's just bad. It's just bad. Yeah. So I think conclusion, uh, it's still good, but maybe we should learn to not be incompetent at building things in America, so we can build more things. Question mark. Question mark. Question mark. I think that would be a great idea. Yeah. So. I, yeah. Moral I, of the story. Put some snake repellent on your ankles, various American transit agencies, so we can spot ben- spending $200 million a mile on light rail, $100 million a mile on BRT, and, you know, 500 to $2 billion a mile on Metro. Please, God. <laughs> because if we could pretty please, you know, uh, build that institutional knowledge and do good contracting and maybe scale back the environmental impact studies just a little bit... <laughs> California's doing that, actually. Oh, that really? Well, Are they? For the high-speed For transit rail? projects only. That's, that's reason, a start. That's fair, because it, it's never going to get done if they don't do that. Yeah, no, the EIS for the for Cal California high-speed rail is finished. I imagine that's, <laughs> like, like about a million pages. It, yeah, 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 about a billion pages <laughs> in a trillion years, yeah. yeah. Wow. Well, yeah, that's, that's the episode for today, a little bit shorter than normal. Um, but you know what you should do now that you've listened to this episode is you should... Like, leave a comment, and subscribe on YouTube. Follow and give us a rating on iTunes and Spotify. And go visit our website or follow us on Twitter, where you can see me, Urbanist, shoot posting every single day. <laughs> and thank you to our patrons, Phobos2390. Curtis Herring. Mike Christensen. Those are our frontrunner to your patrons. Thank you very much. Jacob Whitecotton. And Brian Smith, our redline to your patrons. And thank you to Martin Hoker Martinez, DJ Will Watkins, Ethan McDonald, and Ben Busath. Those Those are our Blue Line tier patrons. At $3. Thank you very much for paying us to do whatever it is that we do. Goodbye. Yep. Go. Go Utes. Woo! (laughs) 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 (